Hello, and welcome to this GGB webinar. My name is Matthew, and I will be your Global Spec Moderator, and I want to review a few housekeeping items with you before we begin. Please take a moment to familiarize yourself with the operation of the user interface for today's webinar. The large window with the heading presentation in the upper left is the primary window for today's session. Just to the right of the main presentation window is the speaker bio window with background information on today's presenters. Just below that is the Q&A window. At any time during the presentation, you can enter a question into the box in the lower section of the window and click Submit. Your question will be placed into the queue to address when we get to the Q&A session. At the bottom of your screen, you will see additional buttons to enhance your webinar experience. To see what a particular button does, just place your mouse pointer over it, and a tooltip will appear with a description of the button's functions. Now I would like to introduce today's presenters, Jonathan O'Neill and Dr. Michael Kim. Jonathan O'Neill holds a BS in Mechanical Engineering from Rowan University and has over nine years of experience in the industry. O'Neill has been with GGB for seven years in the Applications Engineer role and has developed a strong focus in fluid power, construction, and agricultural markets. Dr. Michael Kim holds a PhD in Materials Engineering from Drexel University and has spent 25 years in the development, testing, and application of tribological materials. Guys, welcome to today's event. And with that, I will pass things along to you to get started. Thanks, Matt. <clears throat> Thank you for that introduction. This is Mike Kim, <coughs> excuse me. And as you can see here, the title of our presentation today is uh, Slippery When Wet. We're gonna talk about lubrication fundamentals. So before we do that, we've got to say a little bit about GGB. GGB at, at GGB, we make uh, polymer bearings of many different kinds. As it says here, we make metal polymer, uh, engineered plastics, which are molded bearings. We make fiber resin composites. We make polymer coatings, and we do some stuff in metals. But now let's get to the good stuff. So before we start talking about our lubrication fundamentals, we thought it would be interesting to talk about the history of lubrication and how far back it goes. Well, we know that, uh, or historians know anyway, that if you go way back into the Stone Age, you see that uh, people learned that you could lubricate logs with tree sap, and they would use these logs as sleds and probably uh, carry their game back to their home or their camp and made easier by the lubrication that they were using. Uh, the next big step that we find in, in the lubrication uh, timeline, lubrication history, came in uh, with the Sumerians when uh, they invented the wheel. They invented the wheel around 3500 BC, and they learned to lubricate that with animal fat. Now, originally, the wheel that they invented was not actually used for transportation. It was used for pottery, and it took a couple hundred years for them to figure out that the wheel was good for transportation. And along about the same time, we see that the Egyptians were using animal fat as a lubricant also. And then the next big step we find is that up around 2600 BC, historians have found a chariot within one of the pharaoh's tombs that had rendered fat from beef or ram on it, rendered fat being boiled down animal fat to be sort of like a hard grease. And the next big step on our timeline, we see that in China, they figured out that lead was a good lubricant, which later ended up being uh, very helpful uh, in our even current tribological materials. They were adding lead to vegetable oil and using that as a lubricant. Then we jump all the way up to about 800 AD, where the Vikings were using whale oil to lubricate things like uh, their rudders and the, uh, the mechanisms on their sailing ships. And around about the same time, this is a pretty important one, uh, in Persia, they learned to do petroleum distillation. That is, they could fractionate petroleum and, and get out of it what they wanted. Later, that's going to become a very big deal for us. But um, long about 1500 AD then, Leonardo da Vinci, who was probably the first tribologist, uh, identified something called the friction coefficient, which we use today very frequently and very often. And then uh, in 1687, Isaac Newton termed viscosity to describe uh, the properties of, of, of a lubricant or of liquids in general. Uh, 
And then up around 1850, then starts to become very relevant to what we do today. We've got modern petroleum distillation that is using uh, crude oil and dividing up into its various fractions. And originally they were using this only for kerosene because they were at the time replacing whale oil in lamps with kerosene. But later that became very, very important as uh, with the invention of the automobile in about 1880, both for gasoline and for lubricating oil. Then we get into the late 1800s, and uh, it's uh, notable to talk about the first auto drip lubricator was invented in the U.S. by a guy named McCoy. And shortly after McCoy invented his auto drip lubricator, a lot of cheap substitutes came out. So in his advertisement, he talked about the fact that if you wanted good quality, you had to get the real McCoy, which is where the term came from. Then um, we see that the first synthetic oils were uh, – invented in France in around 1877. And as we get into the 20th century, we see that the grease zerk or the grease fitting was invented by a guy by the name of Oscar Zerkowitz. So that's where the term grease zerk comes from. In the 1950s, we started coming up with multi-grade oils uh, for automobile. And then the term tribology, which is important to people like me, was invented in the UK in 1966. So, Let's talk some more about the history of lubrication. Nature's, Mother Nature has been doing this a lot longer than we have. Uh, there's two images right here which kind of talk about how nature uses lubrication. The one on the left is the pitcher plant. It's a carnivorous plant. What you see here is a picture of an ant which, is, which has been lured up to the top of this cup or, or rim, which is lubricated very well, which causes the ant to fall in and be digested for dinner by the plant. And of course, most of us have probably seen uh, slug slime. It's that gross thing that you see maybe on the pavement in the morning after the slugs have gone by. But slugs create slime as a lubricant to make motion easier and protect the slugs underside against the rough surface, against abrasion and harm. It's also a defense mechanism that makes it harder for predators to, uh, to grab the slug and eat them. So given all that, how are we going to talk about the lubrication fundamentals? Well, we're going to talk about the background, which we're already in, but we're going to continue with that. Then very quickly, and very quickly, we're going to talk a little bit about solid lubricants and transfer films. Then we're going to talk about grease and then some additives to grease, and then a little bit about lubricant corrosion because that's an important negative side effect of lubricants. Then we're going to get into lubrication theory, and I'm going to uh, start to address the Strybeck curve then talk about boundary lubrication. Then I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, John, who's going to talk about hydrodynamic lubrication, about elastohydrodynamic and hydrostatic lubrication. And then John's going to end up with just some practical aspects of uh, lubricant, lubricant, about bearing design, et cetera, uh, relative to lubrication. Well, Let's talk about surfaces in contact and relative motion for a minute. And this picture down in the bottom right, that's good old Leonardo da Vinci who came up with the friction coefficient. We've got just above Leonardo, we've got the formula for the friction coefficient. And the friction coefficient equals, or excuse me, the force of friction equals the normal force times the friction coefficient. And of course, our, our schematic here on the left shows you've, you've got uh, two bodies in relative motion and this red circle indicates the, the point of contact, the asperities in contact, and then the normal force pushing these two things together. <clears throat> so what can cause friction? Well, there's three main sources of friction that affect us. One is you have adhesive friction, where the surface asperities, which we show here, actually stick together. And um, that can cause friction it can result in wear. The second one is plowing, which happens with, uh, when the asperities cut into each other or when you have abrasive debris. So those, two first, <clears throat> those th first two bullet points identify basically the two major causes of wear, which are adhesive wear and abrasive wear. And then the third one we're gonna talk about, at least in this webinar, is lubricant shear. And that's what happens when you have a hydrodynamic film and you don't have contact between surfaces, and the friction is generated by the, uh, by the shear within, within the lubricant. Uh, 
So what's a lubricant? Hmm. Well, it's a third body introduced between two sliding solids. Basically, it is a dissimilar material. That is a material that is very much unlike the sliding surfaces that are in contact. And the more dissimilar a material is, the less it will adhere. So what does it do? Well, it will reduce friction and wear. It will reduce heating. We can use it sometimes to uh, evacuate wear debris that's gotten into a sliding system. It can prevent against oxidation. Some people, a lot of people use grease specifically to prevent corrosion within the system. And it can have a, a sealing function. <clears throat> grease can also do that. So lubrication types, well, we've got a couple that we're going to talk about here. First is fluid film lubrication. You've got hydrodynamic or hydrostatic lubrication, in which case you get a fluid film separating two bodies that are in relative motion, and John's going to talk about those. The other type is when you have sliding surfaces in contact. So what you do when you have sliding surfaces that actually have contact with each other you use incompatible materials as lubricant, either between the two sliding surfaces or you inject a third body, which is an external lubricant, which is much more what this, uh, this webinar is about. Well, you can have boundary lubrication with oil. That is when you have oil in the system, but you have contact between the surfaces. You can have grease lubrication, or you can have solid lubrication. Now, you can also have transfer films, which form through sliding lubrication, and we're not going to spend a lot of time on that here. Um, but quickly, you have uh, your solid lubrication. You have a number that it can be PTFE, Teflon, many would call it, is a very good solid lubricant. Molysulfide and graphite have this, uh, this layered structure that we see over on the right, which the uh, layers in those structures are very loosely bound and they can slide against each other very easily and act as a solid lubricant. And then you have inherently lubricated lubricant surfaces. Polymers, for example, sliding against metals tend to be inherently lubricious. A little bit more on these dry lubricants. Here's just another schematic of how they work. The top one shows a, a deck of cards uh, which kind of acts as a good uh, as a good practical explanation of how these work. And the middle one, uh, the middle diagram shows the uh, the layered structure with very strong bonds within the layers, but very weak bonds between them, and thus they are able to shear easily and, and lubricate as a result. As we said, graphite's a good one. Hexagonal boron nitride. <clears throat> molysulfide or tungsten sulfide, and PTFE, which does not have this structure, but it's inherently, inherently lubricious, can also act in that way. Now, I said I'm not going to talk about transfer films. One or two small comments as we go forward. But we have another webinar being given by GGB coming up in May, <clears throat> which, which is specifically on that topic. So feel free to come back and, and check that out. So now let's talk about grease. Let me make one quick comment here. I, I went back and I looked at the description of the course, which probably attracted a lot of people in on this. And we said that we were going to talk about different kinds of greases and when to use the different greases, etc. Hope it's not a great disappointment, but we're not going to spend a lot of time on that. Uh, just a few slides and, and some quick explanations. But one of the things we have to talk about is viscosity here. And viscosity is a measure of fluid resistance to deformation. It describes the magnitude of internal friction within a fluid. And it's measured by force per unit area, uh, resisting a flow in which parallel layers move relative to one another. And as we said a little bit earlier, the term was identified by Isaac Newton in 1687. Well, we've got several important terms within this. You've got dynamic viscosity, and we talk about dynamic viscosity in terms of a poise, which is pascal seconds, or more commonly people talk about it as centipoise. 
And you can see there the, the conversion from poise to centipoise. And water has a viscosity of just about one on the centipoise scale at, at room temperature. The other important thing here is this kinematic viscosity where you take the dynamic viscosity and normalize by the, the density of the material. And you can see the formula there. Now, just um, a few different fluids just to uh, talk about terms of scale. Our blood is uh, a little bit more viscous than water at, at a viscosity of three. Honey gets all the way up to 6,000. Typically, molasses 7,500. Chocolate syrup and ketchup continue to go up the scale. And peanut butter, you can see there, is about a quarter million centipoids. Uh, what might be interesting to some is that uh, here is SAE 10 oil. And we're going to talk a little bit about what that SAE scale means in just a minute. At room temperature, it's got a viscosity of 65, but at 100 C, which is much more practical uh, temperature for motor oil, it's down around 4.1. So what's that SAE oil rating mean? Well, of course, we already said that higher viscosity means more resistance to flow. <clears throat> and for a 10W40 oil, the W means winter. It doesn't mean weight. It means winter. So 10W weights the fluidity in winter. And lower means easier to distribute. So a 10W40 must fall in a range of uh, 40 to 16 centipoids at 100 C. In the 70s, just, for, just to talk about the scale, in the 70s, 10W30 became more common. In the 90s, uh, 5W30, and in 2013, SAE developed a rating for 0W16. And uh, some may know very well that the viscosities of oil have been going down as uh, fuel economy, as great a desire for fuel economy has, uh, has driven that. Because if you remember, we said a few minutes ago that friction can be driven by shear of the oil. So since in the engine we have a fluid film at the surface between uh, the, the cylinder and the piston ring, uh, the shear of that oil and its viscosity means a lot as far as the fuel economy of your vehicle. Ah, grease. Okay. What about grease? Well, grease is a shear thinning semi-solid fluid. Uh, and shear thinning means that the viscosity is reduced under shear, like ketchup. Ketchup does the same thing. How is grease made up? Well, it's got a base oil and a thickener. That's what it is. It is thickened oil. We can use additives. We can use friction modifiers. Some people use PTFE. Some use molysulfide, graphite, CDDP. I'm, I'm not going to read out the name of what ZDDP stands for. ZDDP is common in motor oil because what it does is it actually forms a lubricious film on the sliding surface, which helps reduce friction and wear. Sometimes we use corrosion inhibitors. We use things for seizure resistance, and we use extreme pressure additives, both in oil and in grease. And those extreme pressure additives have some very serious negative effects in terms of corrosion. We're going to talk about those. Ah, let's talk about grease versus oil. Well, <clears throat> what about grease? Well, compared to oil, it's more likely to stay in place. You can pump it, but you can't pump it like you can pump oil. We have customers that use automatic greasing systems all the time for some of our bearings. <clears throat> it's more temperature susceptible, and there's a reason for that. It's not that the, the base uh, lubricant is more temperature susceptible, but because it can't move as freely as oil, it will be susceptible to the uh, temperature in place. Well, low temperature viscosity is, is a real serious issue. Um, when grease gets cold, it gets very solid. Um, that can be a problem. If you expect uh, lubrication as it has at a higher temperature, when the temperature drops, the, uh, the lubricity can go away. It can be a dirt magnet. 
And we know that very well, that uh, grease can actually suck dirt into a sliding surface. That's a problem. It can be used to displace the dirt. You can replace the dirty grease with, green, with clean grease, but it does suck the dirt in. And as I'm going to show you, it can be displaced from the load zone in a negative way. Sometimes we say the first bullet point says more likely to stay in place, but it doesn't always, and we're going to talk about that. <clears throat> Oil, on the other hand, can move very freely. It's more easily distributed. It could be pumped to be cooled. That's what we said about the difference between grease and oil and its temperature susceptibility. And it's got Strybeck effects that, are, that can be very positive for us. And you can have a full fluid film from oil, and we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that. Here's an example of um, greased bronze bearing compared to a composite. And what we have here, you see this saw blade kind of motion that uh, we had uh, a bronze bearing running at 5 KSI, 15 cycles a minute, plus and minus 30 degrees against the hardened steel shaft. So we lubricated it. You can see the friction started around 0.12. Quickly, within 7,000 cycles, it, the friction ran up. We stopped it. We re-lubricated. It came down. It went back up with oscillation. And that saw blade effect uh, is the result of the lubricant being displaced from the load zone. And the fact that it's so high in the beginning and, and lower at the end, we believed was because you had abrasive debris being created in the beginning from the sliding effect. and um, through several greasing cycles, that was purged, and you got the steady state system at the end, but you still had the effect of the lubricant being displaced. Real quick, that dotted line at the bottom is the friction of a composite bearing resulting from transfer film formation. And as I said before, we're not going to talk about that. We've got a whole webinar on that, and it's coming in May, so please come back and see that. Here I said, here's another example of grease being displaced, but We've got the greased, uh, greased polymer bushing, and what we did is we, on the bottom, we put the same graph we just saw a minute ago, and on the top is a polymer bushing. And so, basically, the end of this test is 100,000 cycles, whereas the one at the bottom uh, was uh, re-greased every 7,000. So this polymer bushing was greased once at the beginning, and at about 50,000 cycles, the friction started to go up because the grease was being displaced from the load zone. But another thing you see is the magnitude of the friction in the 0.05, the 0.06 range was much lower than the friction of the grease bronze, which has to do with the inherent lubricity of the polymer coming into play as compared to a metal on metal that you have in the bottom. And this concept of um, external lubrication and internal lubrication is going to come back with us in a minute. So EP additives, they're used in industrial gear lubes, chlorine, potassium borate, sulfur phos, et cetera. Uh, the EP additive activates at higher temperatures, and it forms a lubricious transfer film. Very good. It's very positive. It's used in gear oils, uh, used in some greases. But um, it's got a negative, and that is here we've got one of our bearings, uh, this is a polymer bearing. It's got three layers. It's got a steel layer, a porous bronze layer, and a polymer layer. And so what we did is we tested this in a gear oil with an EP additive. And the top uh, EDS curve spectrum shows the composition before, where you get it's showing copper and tin, as it's supposed to. That's the bronze showing up. But afterwards, you can see the uh, in the... Uh, in the image, you can see the, uh, the corrosion product, and you can see on the right all the new peaks that result from that corrosion product, showing that the bronze had actually corroded by testing in the gear oil. So that's a negative you got to really watch out for when you're using, uh, using some lubricants, especially with red metals, as they call copper and the like. Quick on boundary lubrication, let's, let's start talking about the Strybeck. Okay? So you've got a lubricant film here. And so you've got a layer of lubricant that exists between the two. On the left, we show that you've got contact between the two with lubricant in the system. And on the right, you've got a continuous film. And so what we talk about, we talk about lambda, the Italian parameter, is a function of H, which is the film thickness, uh, divided by some measure of the roughness. In this place, we're using RQ, a combined roughness of the two different um, 
good for sliding surfaces. So what happens is when the roughness is greater than the film thickness, you're going to get contact like you have on the left. So this is a stride that curve. John's going to talk a lot more about this. Right now we're going to talk about uh, the boundary lubrication, the, the section on the left. And what we show is we show two curves superimposed over each other, where if you only look in boundary lubrication, you see a metal versus metal, metal sliding on metal. Again, you have contact versus metal against the self-lube material, like a polymer or like a PTFE bearing. So our lambda is less than one, so we have contact, but you can see the effect of the self-lube material where the friction of the system is lower than it is metal on metal. So you've got two things going on. You've got the effect of the external lubrication, and you've got the self-lubricious aspect of the material system that's sliding against each other. It's pretty critical. that We, we, we have developed a whole uh, business around this concept. As we sell polymer bearings, and they, uh, they work well like this in boundary lubrication. One quick bit of data, and I think we're going to switch over to John. So this is a schematic of a wear test. We actually call it the boundary lubricated wear test because it's operating in boundary lubrication. And you've seen this picture on the right before. This is one of our polymer bearings, which has a porous bronze uh, system with a polymer, a PTFE uh, filled Teflon impregnant in it. And so what you've got is the shaft is spinning, the bushing is stationary, and we're forcing oil into this. You can see there's a housing and you've got an anti-rotational device which is uh, being forced up against the load cell to record the friction. So the load comes down and uh, develops the friction, and let, then let's see what happens. So what we did is we tested a bronze bearing, actually a leaded bronze bearing, against, uh, in comparison to that PTFE line bushing you just saw a minute ago, and you can see up here we're, we're operating at uh, 28 megapascals and uh, 0.05 meter per second with a very thin hydraulic oil. And we ran this, if possible, we ran it for 100 hours, even though the bronze didn't make it there. So you can see that the leaded bronze at all points in this test had a higher friction than the PTFE bushing. So what we see right here is in a very practical way, we see the combined effects of the external lubricant with the lubricious nature inherent to the system. Here's the wear of the two. Now, of course, PTFE is a lot softer than bronze, so you would think it might be more prone to wear. But as you can see here, the two uh, columns on the left show the wear of the bronze bearing, much greater than the wear of the polymer bearing, which hardly wore at all. So you've got the friction effect of the lubricious system, and then you've got the wear effect, which follows it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John, and John's going to talk about uh, hydrodynamic lubrication. Go ahead, John. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, so as Mike mentioned, I'm going to start to talk to you guys about hydrodynamic lubrication. Um, and so we'll get into that now. So as Mike mentioned earlier, we can have a lubricant film that is thin and discontinuous as a boundary and mixed film operation or a film that is thick and continuous, as is necessary for hydrodynamic lubrication, which we'll talk about right now. Again, we see here uh, lambda, the Italian parameter, and we'll get into that parameter a bit more in the next slide, but as a reminder, it is essentially the ratio between the minimum film thickness H required for HDL operation and the combination of the mating surface roughness values. So I'm bringing back this slide on the Strabeck curve to show the regime where full separation of the mating surfaces exists, this hydrodynamic area on the right. Again, we have the friction coefficient mu on the y-axis, and we have a relationship of speed, viscosity, and load on the x-axis. Here you can see that for hydrodynamic conditions to occur, lambda should be greater than 3. At this point, where full stable hydrodynamic support occurs, the coefficient of friction is still low and becomes proportional to Zn over P, you know, the x-axis here. Then, as conditions become more demanding, for example, with increasing speed, the power losses become greater, giving a corresponding increase to the coefficient of friction. At some point, 
the resulting increase in temperature will become significant enough to exacerbate this by reducing the viscosity and hence the film thickness. So let's dive a little deeper into how each of these parameters on the x-axis affect our film development. The variables on the x-axis come from the Sommerfeld number, which we'll discuss a little bit more in the next slide. This part of the Sommerfeld number is often referred to as the Hersey number, named after Mayo D. Hersey, who's an American engineer, and he worked alongside uh, Richard Strybeck on this plane bearing research. So most of this information is pretty intuitive. You know, but let's look at each variable, starting with the fluid viscosity. You know, higher viscosity, you know, or thicker uh, lubricant, as Mike mentioned earlier, um, it'll have an increased tendency towards film formation. We'll see a greater friction, you know, or resistance to fluid shear um, in the hydrodynamic regime. Next, we'll look at the relative velocity between the two sliding surfaces. You know, higher speeds tend to lead to film formation. So, so, uh, so far, this makes sense if we think about it in terms of the x-axis from the Strybeck curve. You know, both terms are in the numerator, so increasing either of them will lead to a larger value, putting us further to the right on that graph. And then finally, we'll look at the load normal to the sliding interface. We can increase the load to a certain extent, but at some point, the load becomes too much for the film to support. So increasing loads tends to reduce the tendency of film formation. Again, thinking about the Strybeck curve, since this term is in the denominator, increasing it will reduce the value on the x-axis, bringing us more towards mixed film or even boundary lubrication. So as I mentioned earlier, the x-axis of the Strybeck curve uses part of the Sommerfeld number. Uh, that part of the Sommerfeld number is known as the Hersey number. You can see it here that the Hersey number is essentially the second term in this equation. You know, the Sommerfeld number is a dimensionless entity and named after Arnold Sommerfeld, and it's very useful in hydrodynamic lubrication calculations because it encompasses most of the variables needed for designing a bushing in such conditions. And depending on your familiarity with hydrodynamics and lubrication, you might have come across slightly different versions of the Sommerfeld number at some point in time. For example, there's a version of this equation that uses angular velocity in radians per second instead of revolutions per second. Um, this ver the version of the Sommerfeld number you see here uh, is very practical for use in general industry. But you may have seen a reciprocal of this number in textbooks or other published works or even other lectures. We won't dive into the derivation of the Sommerfeld number in this webinar, but I feel you should know that there are variations that exist out there. The Sommerfeld number, oftentimes referred to as the bearing characteristic number, can be used along with a journal's bearing's eccentricity ratio uh, to help determine whether a certain film thickness is suitable for a given application. So here's a chart that can be found in some of GGB's metal polymer bearing catalogs that can be used to help determine in which lubrication regime your bearing will operate. Based on the geometry of the bearing, relative sliding speed and viscosity, we can determine a maximum specific load that will permit the formation of hydrodynamic film. The x-axis on the chart is velocity, so you can see for a set point on the y-axis, as you increase the speed, you'll move from area 1 to area 2 to area 3, which is full hydrodynamic lubrication, and beyond. So let's dive into each area a little bit more in detail. So in area 1, the bearing will operate in boundary lubrication. And PV, you know, you know pressure times velocity, I'm sorry, uh, will be the major determinant in bearing life. In area two, the bearing will operate with mixed film lubrication, and PV is no longer a significant parameter in determining bearing life. Bearing performance will depend on the nature of the fluid and the actual service conditions. In area three, the bearing will operate in, with hydrodynamic lubrication. You know, bearing wear will be determined only by the cleanliness of the lubricant and by the frequency of startup and shutdown periods. So area four, you know, we like to say dragons live here. You know, it's not a good place to be. Uh, it's the most demanding condition, you know, so due to either high speed or high load to viscosity ratio or, or both. It may cause excessive temperature and or, you know, pretty high wear. You know, we like to avoid this area if we can help it. But if not, you, know, you should contact your GGB application engineer, and there are some things we can do to help your bearing survive in this space. So now we're going to get into the mechanics of hydrodynamic lubrication a little bit. So around the same time, from around 1883 to around 1886, uh, three folks, Reynolds, Petroff, and Tower, you know, were all working independently on this subject of lubrication,
and all had a major impact on the development of modern tribology. Most notably, it was discovered that pressure is generated by diverging wedges and oil films, as you can see in the slide. So the block is moving with some velocity v and a load f is applied. The pressure generated in this wedge allows the block to fully separate from the surface below it. So now we'll see how this looks in the journal bearing. So figure one shows a plane bearing that was originally flooded with oil but has been stationary for some time while carrying a load F. You know, for the sake of clarity, clearance is exaggerated in this slide a little bit. So the oil has almost in, been entirely squeezed out of the loaded area A and there will be direct bearing to shaft contact. Most oil will have drained away, but a certain amount will adhere to the shaft and collect around points B and C on the sides there. In an actual bearing, the clearance will be so small that the oil may in fact fill the whole circumferential space. So moving on to figure two, you know, if the shaft is slowly rotated in a clockwise direction, it will have a relatively high coefficient of friction in the dry area, and the shaft will tend to roll up one side of the bearing until it slips or skids. This happens because the shaft moves into a well-oiled area of the bearing and because it's trying to roll up a hill of increasing steepness. Eventually, at some position near to that shown here, you know, stability will be achieved and that you know, any moderate loads and speeds, rotation of the shaft will occur in an eccentric position. As we spoke about earlier, uh, this is boundary lubrication. So now let's see what happens if the shaft is rotated at a much higher speed. You know, provided that the load is not too great, more and more oil will be dragged into the working area in the form of a wedge until, at some critical speed, this wedge of oil will lift the shaft out of contact with the bearing and the load will be carried wholly by the oil pressure generated. So under these conditions, stability is achieved with the shaft moving to a new position of eccentricity on the other side of the center line, as you can see in figure three. This is, you know, known, this condition is known as hydrodynamic um, and we have full fluid film separation. So on this slide, this is just a graphical representation of film thickness versus each individual parameter of load, speed, and viscosity. As we discussed earlier with viscosity and speed, you know, for a given load, film thickness tends to increase as these parameters are increased. Meanwhile, film thickness tends to decrease as load increases for a given viscosity and rotational speed. And so previously we spoke about the Italian parameter, or lambda, uh, which is the ratio of minimum film thickness over the composite surface roughness of each surface in contact. So with journal bearings, roughness values like RA, RZ, and Rmax are considered. Rmax can be especially relevant to hydrodynamic lubrication as the fluid film will need to overcome the highest roughness peak in order to avoid scoring and abrasion. So, if the lubricating film is dirty you know, or contains some foreign object debris, we can run into issues with abrasion when the particle side is greater than the fluid film thickness. So if we take a look at the image on the right, this is a DU bearing under magnification. Here we can see some scoring of the polymer bearing liner caused by a large particle of contamination. So let's talk about EHL or you know, the elastohydrodynamic effect. You know, so what is this effect? What is the elastohydrodynamic effect? Well, elastohydrodynamic lubrication, or EHL we'll call it for short, uh, is a form of hydrodynamic lubrication in which pressures are large enough to cause significant deformation to the surfaces. So why is that good? Well, essentially, it lowers the barrier to entry to full fluid film lubrication by reducing the contact pressure of the mating components. So let's compare the lubrication curves of the metal on metal system, like that of a bronze bearing on a steel shaft, with the self lube bearing on metal system, like that of a GGB DP31 metal polymer bearing on a steel shaft. So because the DP31 bearing liner can elastically deform, thereby reducing the contact pressure, uh, you know, the denominator of the X axis is lower meaning that we can get into full hydrodynamic lubrication quicker with less speed and a less viscous lubricant. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, it's 
normally the bearing that deforms in relation to the shaft of the EHL, but I think here it's easier to show shaft deformation since it's the large component on the screen. In the image on the left, you can see that the shaft is round and the load zone is relatively small. In this case, we'll assume each material in the system is relatively hard and doesn't deform. You know, now let's compare that to the image on the right. In this image, we see the shaft is deforming under the given load. Contact area conformance is improved due to the elastic deformation, and this reduces the contact pressure, which allows for easier fluid film formation. You know, think back to the Hersey number and you know, the denominator. So let's get into some real-life examples of you know, EHL. So the introduction of GGBDU, you know, PTFE line bearings, you know, Teflon bearings, um, and the EHL effect that is possible with such a bearing was a breakthrough for pump applications like the external gear pump. You know, originally these pumps used bronze or Babbitt bearings, and in this application, as the gear pump, you know, the gears of the pump they rotate and create flow. You know, pressure is increased on the fluid as the fluid does work on the components downstream. So the central pressure exerted on the gears causes the gear shafts to deflect, which in turn causes concentrated edge loading on the bearings. And this edge loading made hydrodynamic film generation difficult with the bronze and Babbitt bearings. You know, the relatively soft polymer liner of the DU bearings would elastically deform under these loads and allow HDL film formation even at the highest pump pressures. So this is possible due to the construction of the metal polymer bearing. You know, on the right, we can see a cross-section of a typical GGB metal polymer bearing like DU or DP31. You now we have the steel backing, which gives the bearing its strength. Then we have a porous bronze center layer, and impregnated into that centered bronze is the polymer sliding layer. So the combination of the porous bronze and polymer liner allows this elastic deformation to occur during operation. So let's go over to hydrostatic lubrication. We'll talk about that for a couple minutes. So just as it sounds, you know, hydrostatic lubrication doesn't rely on relative motion of sliding surfaces to create a fluid film. You know, with hydrostatic lubrication, high pressure oil is fed to the interface by an external system to fully separate the surfaces. You know, this is used in applications that experience, you know, extremely high loads, such as with large machinery. Applications that see low speed and or the need for extreme accuracy in motion, you know, almost like the Mount Palomar telescope. Or in applications where oil pressure is readily available, uh, like a swash plate bearing interface in an axial piston pump. So tying this all together, um, this is a great example of fluid film lubrication, uh, our knee joint. You know, so here we have a few main effects to consider. Uh, depending on the activity we're performing in you know, our lives. So the knee joint is comprised of a few different entities, but we'll focus on the articular cartilage and the synovial fluid. So car cartilage is porous. It's about 20% solid and 80% fluid. You know, so the synovial fluid reduces the friction between the articulating cartilage and other joint tissues to help cushion the joint. You know, as, as humans, our knee joint operates under a ton of conditions, so let's consider a few. So we'll start with a low-stress operating condition like, you know, normal walking. You know, so you can just picture, this is your favorite actress walking down the red carpet. You know, it's a low-stress condition, and the knee joint operates in boundary lubrication with low friction. So now let's think of a high-stress high activity that's on the extreme opposite end of the spectrum from walking. You know, let's think about LeBron James or, you know, for Sixers fans like myself, Joel Embiid, going off for a dunk. You know, once they dunk the ball and land back on the court, their knee joints go through a pretty high-stress situation. You know, when they land, the spongy cartilage deforms, giving us some EHL effect, you know, the elastohydrodynamic effect. But this deformation of the cartilage also squeezes synovial fluid through its pores to hydrostatically keep the joint members separated. You know, Mother Nature is the ultimate engineer, I say. You know, so continuing with our knee joint example, something negative that can, can occur over time is that the articular cartilage can become embrittled and damaged. When this occurs, we get less of the squeeze film effect of the synovial fluid in high stress operation, and in extreme cases, we can get bone-on-bone -bone contact. You know, this can be quite painful. So you know, this is why it's important to have proper lubrication in systems that require it you know, in the human body or in you know, industrial applications. 
so up until this point, we've talked about lubrication theory, lubrication regimes, and the importance of fluid film lubrication. But now let's pivot to practical lubrication and discuss some of the ways we can design bearings for optimal performance in lubricated applications. Bearing the journal clearance plays a critical role in journal bearing performance. You know, having too little clearance is a major issue, but having too much clearance can cause issues of its own. So too little clearance restricts lubricant flow, which will impede fluid film formation. And as we've seen in the previous section of the webinar, uh, you know, not having a robust fluid film when one is needed is a huge concern. You know, if we're using materials with dissimilar thermal expansion rates, too little clearance can cause issues when the temperature changes to the point where the bearing and journal can be in interference, actually. And along those lines, if we have too little clearance, even at room temperature, you know, we may face difficulties with assembly, like trying to pass the shaft through the bearing ID, you know, without damaging it. So, too much clearance, you know, on the other hand, will minimize film thickness development since the oil cavity may become too large to completely fill the lubricant. You know, too much clearance can cause misalignment and lead to severe edge loading of the bearing or even functional issues with the assembly and applications, you know, like gear pumps where gear mesh tolerances are critical. Finally, if the clearance is too great, this may promote bearing instability or shaft whirl. Um, when the bearing is operating under low loads and high speeds, you know, this, can tend, this can lead to premature end of the bearing's useful life and other potential component damage. And so how can clearance be controlled in application? What parameters affect journal bearing clearance? Well, a few things can impact clearance. First and foremost is the tolerance stack of the system. Typically, the stack up includes the shaft, housing, and bearing tolerances. You know, all these components and their tolerances will impact a clearance range. You know, we must also take into consideration both thermal and elastic expansion of the components. You know, for example, if we're installing a steel back bronze bearing into a thin walled aluminum housing, you know, the elastic expansion of the housing from the bearing interference may increase the clearance of the bearing ID and shaft. You know, similarly, in the same example, if the system operates in a wide temperature range, the clearance will be different when operating at 20C as compared to operating at 120C. And if the bearing cannot be machined or burnished after installation in the housing, then this full tolerance stack-up applies. Now, however, you know, some plain bearing materials, you know, such as you know, GGB's DTS-10, you know, HIAX, or, or even DP-31, um, they can be machined or burnished in situ, meaning after they've been installed in the housing. You know, with this type of material, we can have more precise control of the clearance as we can machine the ID of the bearing once it's installed. You know, so for dry running applications, we don't need to rely upon oil or grease to provide additional lubrication, so the minimum clearance can be less than that of a lubricated application. However, even if the bearing will operate in boundary or mixed film lubrication, the same clearance recommendations as that for hydrodynamic lubrication may apply. You know, a typical grease bearing application uh, is a kingpin bearing for heavy-duty truck upgrades. So GGB, we supply many DX10 bushings for this type of application with great success. You know, in applications such as this, uh, these grease bearings perform well with minimum relative clearance. You know, with relative minimum clearances approaching, you know, 0.5 microns per millimeter. And also, as you can see from the image of the DX10 bearing on the right, uh, the pin and dents of the polymer liner help retain and distribute grease evenly over the bearing surface. You know, we touched on this earlier in the presentation, but mating surface finish also plays a key role for performance and long-term durability of lubricated bearings. When the surface is too rough, uh, we can experience abrasive wear, which will increase friction in the boundary and mixed film conditions. Also, as mentioned previously, if the surface is too rough, uh, we may impede fluid film development as we need to overcome you know, those highest peaks to ensure robust film generation. You know, below are some mating surface recommendations for lubricated applications. You know, the takeaway here is that for lubricated applications, typically smoother is better, especially for those demanding hydrodynamic applications. And so if clearance is important to lubricant flow, what else can we do to promote proper lubrication through our lubricated bearing? And that's a good question. So some things we can do, um, you know, adding grooves or holes or both uh, in a bearing is a common method for feeding lubricant to a bearing. You know, this type of feature will be dependent on the application, but each has its place in a given system. 
you know, for example, in the DTS-10 bearing shown here, we see three axial grooves that promote flow through the bearing. And grooves can have many functions. You know, grooves can be used to help move fresh oil into the bearing or help rid the bearing of you know, overheated oil when temperature control is critical. Or it can help get oil from one area of an application to another. And holes, you know, they can have several functions, but typically they are used in grease applications to supply grease into the bearing from an external grease fitting, for example. So the hole should be larger than the feed hole in the housing just to ensure no restrictions uh, occur in the supply. All right. So that brings us to the end of our presentation. You know, so we discussed many topics today, such as various lubrication types, the fluid lubrication regimes, you know, boundary, mixed film, and full hydrodynamic, um, film thickness and the factors that impact film development, uh, the elastohydrodynamic effect and where and how it's utilized, corrosion effects on lubrication, lubrication of the you know, human knee and practical aspects of lubricated bearing design. So hopefully you enjoyed our presentation and learned something new and interesting. You know, thank you all for attending. And with that said, uh, Matt, are there any questions? Yes, we have, we have some that came in. Thanks, guys, for that great presentation. We're going to move into the Q&A now. Um, we have some questions that have come in from the attendees, so we're going to answer those. If we don't get to your question, don't worry. We will have an answer for you following the webinar. And if you haven't submitted your question yet, you can do so now by entering it in the Q&A box and clicking Submit. And we'll try to get to it before the close of the session. Okay. Now for our first question from the audience. Uh, why is the bearing liner material important if operating in HDL? Guys? Uh, yeah, so John, go ahead. Mike, you want to answer? Okay. Um, yeah, go so ahead. with that, yeah, um, hold on. Am I on mute or am I? Okay, sorry. You're good. Oh, you're all, all good. Right. Yep, so, go for it. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, so why is the bearing liner important for operating an HDL? Uh, good question. You know, so, you know, as we talked about, when we're in full hydrodynamic lubrication, um, you know, we're fully separated by oil. So we're not going to get the, the coefficient of friction of, you know, the polymer liner and the shaft um, while we're in that condition. So the reason the liner material is important is that not always are we operating an HDL. Um, you know, as I mentioned briefly in the presentation, uh, there are times, especially with you know some some pumps and and, and you know uh, any other applications, that there's going to be periods of starting up and shutting down. And when we're starting up or shutting down, you know, as we saw in, in the one chart there, we're going from areas one, two, three. Um, we're not going to be operating in hydrodynamic because the speeds will be probably too low, um, or you know. If the oil's cold, you know what, what have you. There are many factors, but in those instances, we're going to have direct <laughs> bearing on shaft contact. And with that said, the self-lubricating nature of the uh, you know polymer liner uh, will help in those situations to can, to give us you know low friction and low wear as we're starting up and getting to that hydrodynamic um, situation. So that's that's one of the major. Um, Importance of why we select you know the, the proper uh, bearing material, and then also you know with pump applications, um, we can see some cavitation in in those types of applications, and so we need a bearing material that not only offers low friction and low wear, but uh, is resistant to cavitation, for example. Um, so it, it's it's critical to select the, the appropriate material for that case. Excellent. Thank you for that, John. All right, we have some more questions. We're going to try to squeeze a few in. Uh, next question from the audience. What is the lubrication qualities of water? I'll take that one. Um, thanks, Matt. It's terrible. But it is a lubricant nonetheless. Um, a lot of things are actually lubricated by water. We make bearings that go into hydropower turbines, which sometimes uh, the water is used uh, in two ways. Not only is it pumped to produce electricity, it can actually act to lubricate or cool the bearings. That's the biggest thing, cool the bearings. The water pump in your car is lubricated by it lubricated and cooled by the, the water that it's pumping, even though it's very hot. Um, and, um, you know, Mother Nature uses uh, water as a lubricant. 
and the coolant all the time. So despite the fact that it is terrible as a lubricant, sometimes it's all we've got, and it's used in that way. Excellent. Thank you for that. And uh, we have a couple of questions, actually a couple of comments that came in from the audience thanking us for a great presentation. So thank you very much for your comments. We do appreciate that, and we're glad, we're glad that you're with us. We also have a couple notes asking whether or not um, uh, you can uh, watch the webinar again. Yes, you can. It will be available uh, as an on-demand piece of content uh, approximately in one hour, so you can come back and watch the entire webinar or share it with your colleagues. Okay, let's try to answer a couple more questions here. So moving along, uh, next question from the audience. How has nature impacted tribological design? I'll take that one again, John. It's um, biomimicry, as it is called, is a very significant part of tribological science these days. Um, there are whole, the whole big areas at, uh, at a number of universities, Ohio State's a really big one on this subject, that are studying uh, biomimicry. How can you mimic nature and uh, improve biological systems? One of the ones that everybody has seen, I think, is uh, Michael Phelps, the swimmer, a few Olympics ago, was wearing a suit, as were a number of other people he was competing against the finish of which was patterned after shark skin because it reduced friction going through the water. Uh, another one is GGB actually uh, recently received a patent on a lubricant that was patterned after the uh, pitcher plant that we saw early in the uh, early in the presentation. So nature's been doing this, as they say, for 3.8 billion years. And uh, man is just figuring out how to copy that, but uh, they're hard at it. Great, thanks for that. And it looks like we have time for one last question. Um, so here it is. Can hydraulic cylinder connectors on excavating equipment ever reach HDL? Um, I wouldn't. Sorry, I was on. I was. I was on mute. Um, what, what was that? Was that you, Mike? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'll take it. Can the uh, can the connectors on um, the ends of cylinders reach hydrodynamic? No. No, they don't. They're pretty stable. They they don't move very fast. Um, people either use grease there or they use self lube bearings. We saw a lot of self lube bearings into that application, but. I don't see any way that those would ever move fast enough to reach a hydrodynamic situation. But if you want to do better in that location, our application engineers would be really happy to help you. Excellent. Thank you for that. And we are coming up on time here, so we're going to wrap things up right there. Guys, thanks again uh, for taking the time to be with us today. Thanks for that great presentation and also taking the time to answer some audience questions. I'd like to also thank our audience members for being part of this webinar event. All right, thanks, Matt. Thanks for uh, hosting and putting it all together. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate all the effort. Thanks, everyone. Hi right, guys, sorry about that. Uh, got disconnected temporarily. Uh, just to wrap things up, we are moving to close, and you will be receiving an email from us with a link to the on-demand version of this webinar, so you can come back and watch it again or share it with your colleagues. And lastly, please take a moment to complete a survey, which will appear on your screen at the end of this live webinar. For on-demand viewers, you will find the survey located along the bottom of your attendee console in the survey widget. Again, thank you for taking the time to attend this webinar event. Take care, and we will talk with you soon.